we're just going to jump right into this. So if everybody will take their Bibles and turn over to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30, and the, I don't know if I want to say this is an easy question. Simple maybe, not easy though. Um, simple question though being, do we know God? Do we know our Lord and Savior? Um, with that in mind, we'll go ahead and read verses 1 through 4 of Proverbs 30. It says, The word of Agur, the son of Jekah, the oracle, the man declares to Ithiel, to Ithiel and Ukal, Surely I am more stupid than any man, and do not have the understanding of a man. Neither have I learned wisdom, nor do I have the knowledge of the Holy One, who has ascended into heaven and descended, who has gathered the wind in his fists, who has wrapped the waters in his garment, who has established all the ends of the earth. What is his name or his son's name? Surely you know. And I have to admit that when I came upon this passage, I was a little shocked to see that in Proverbs. Because whenever we think of Proverbs, we think of our typical quick one-liners of wisdom and knowledge that we gather. But I tell you that this passage right here holds a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. For all of us. And the first question we have to ask, and we can answer real quick, is who is Agur? We don't know. There's nothing that gives us any indication of Agur. This is the only place where he's mentioned in the Bible. Um, but we know that he's an oracle. In the King James, it says he's a prophet. Um, either way, it doesn't matter because that word oracle or prophet translates into one with a heavy message, a burdensome message. And Agur finds himself weighed down by this message that he wants to give. He is burdened. And then it goes on to say, the man declares to Ithiel, to Ithiel and Ukal. And again, we don't know who these people are. We just assume that they are disciples, followers of Agur. But some translations take those names and put them into a state of being. So the ESV, I believe, says, the man declares, O oh God, I am weary, O oh God, I am weary and worn out. And when we take that in context with these four verses, it's not far-fetched to think that. Agur, again, has this heavy message, this heavy burden on his heart, and he is worn out and he is weary. And we ask, why is he worn out and weary? And we see that answer in verse 3 where he says, nor do I have the knowledge of the Holy One. And that word knowledge is not just knowledge, knowing something to know it. It's that intimate knowledge of the Holy One, truly knowing the Holy One. In verse 2, Agur says, Surely I am more stupid than any man, and I do not have the understanding of a man. And we get to this and we think to ourselves, man, Agur is really hard on himself. Basically just saying, I'm stupid, I don't know anything. If there's a man out there, surely he has more understanding than me. Because I do not have the understanding of a man. But he's not being hard on himself. What Agur is doing here is he is being real with himself. He is saying, no matter how much knowledge I have, it amounts to nothing if I do not have the knowledge of the Holy One. He's saying that no matter how much knowledge I acquire in this life, it doesn't amount to anything compared to the Holy One, the knowledge that he holds in his hands. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is above us, always. No matter how much knowledge 
we obtain in this life, he always knows more. So Agur, again, is not being hard on himself. He is being real, realizing that no matter how much knowledge he obtains, God knows more. He holds all knowledge. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 25 says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. If God were to ever have a foolish moment, it would still be wiser than our wisest moment. Even in our wisest moment, it's pure foolishness compared to God. We have to realize this. Agur goes on in verse 3 and says, Neither have I learned wisdom, nor do I have the knowledge of the Holy One. And again, this comes to us at a, as a bit of a gut punch. Because if we have just gone through Proverbs and read chapters 1 through 29, we might be thinking to ourselves, I got myself a good amount of knowledge and a good amount of wisdom. But Agur is saying, I have no wisdom, I have no knowledge. Because I do not have the knowledge of the Holy One. Turn over to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and we'll read verses 7 through 11. Paul writes, But whatever things were gained to me, whatever knowledge and wisdom I have gained in my life, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead." So again, I say, no matter how much wisdom or knowledge we obtain in this life, it is not rooted in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is all but rubbish. It doesn't amount to anything. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1 that we all have some knowledge, the knowledge that puffs up. And that's the problem that we see in what we would call mainstream Christianity and within the churches of God. That sometimes we're just too busy knowing stuff to know it, to look, hold it over people's head, to say that we have the truth, that we know better. But we, it's rubbish because it's not rooted in Christ. That knowledge and wisdom amounts to nothing. Colossians 2, verses 2 and 3. Paul writes that their hearts, that our hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and and knowledge. Christ himself is our knowledge and our wisdom. To have knowledge just to have it, to tote it around to make ourselves feel better than everyone else, is not true knowledge. Knowing Christ in a more intimate way, that is knowledge. That is wisdom. And again, there are people within the churches of God and people who go to church on Sunday who can quote the Bible forwards and backwards. 
but if they do not truly know the Holy One, have that intimate knowledge of him, it does not matter. Do we know God? Do we know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Agur goes on into verse 4 asking questions. Who has ascended into heaven and descended? John 3, verse 13, Jesus says, No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Who has ascended into heaven and descended? It is only our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? We know in Matthew 8, verses 23 through 27, we read of the disciples and Jesus in the boat. Jesus is sleeping, and the disciples are currently freaking out because they're in a storm. And they go and wake up Jesus, saying, are you just going to let us die here? And in verse 26 of Matthew 8, Jesus says to them, why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. And, when the, and the men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this? that even the winds and the sea obey him. He is our Lord and Savior. He is the one who gathers the winds in his fists, who has wrapped the waters in his garment. Agur continues on and says, Who has established all the ends of the earth? Turn over to Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38, and we'll start in verse 4, where God finally responds to Job. And he says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who sets its measurements since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who enclosed the sea with doors? When bursting forth, it went out from the womb. When I made a cloud its garment, and the thick darkness its swaddling band, and I placed boundaries on it, and set a bolt in doors, and I said, Thus far you shall come, but, but no farther. And here shall your proud waves stop. In Colossians 1, verses 15 and 17, we read, He, Jesus Christ, is the invisible image of God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Who has established the ends of the earth? Again, it is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then Agur finishes off by asking, What is his name or his son's name? name surely you know and again we get to the heart of the matter knowing the name of our god and of our lord and savior jesus christ do we know them agur knew he needed to know them he knew something was missing and we see it throughout the old testament when jacob wrestled with god Jacob asked, what is your name? Because he knew he needed to know it. Not to have the knowledge of it, to hold it over everybody else's head, but to know him more intimately. Turn over to Judges 13, and we see another example of this.
Judges 13, and uh, I'll set up the context a little bit so we don't have to read the entire chapter. But here we read of Samson's mother and father. Manoah, Samson's father, and his wife. And one day while Manoah's wife was out in the field, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and told her that she would bear a child. And she had been barren and had not conceived in all their years of marriage. But the angel of the Lord comes to her and says, you will receive a child. So she runs and tells Manoah that an angel with the appearance of a man of God came to her and told her that she would have a child. And Manoah, at that moment, prayed to God that that angel would come back so that he could hear the commandments from the angel to know how he was supposed to raise this child. And, the, and God heard Manoah's prayer, and he brought the angel of the Lord back to him. And after the angel of the Lord told Manoah everything that him and his wife were supposed to do in order to raise this child, in verse 15, we'll pick up. And it says, Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you, so that we may prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain, though you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? So that when your words come to pass, we may honor you. And I want to take a brief moment and just point out the fact that the angel of the Lord here answers him without telling him, don't worship me, points to this being Jesus Christ. Because we read in Revelations 19 where John falls and worships an angel just a regular old angel, the angel immediately says, don't worship me. I'm just a servant just like you. So we continue on. Manoah says, what is your name? So that when your words come to pass, we may honor you. But the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offer it, offered it on the rock to the Lord. And he performed, performed wonders while Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came about when the flame went up from the altar toward heaven that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. Now the angel of the Lord did not appear to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. So Manoah said to his wife, We will surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had desired to kill us, we would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain, or he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands. Nor would he have shown us all these things nor would he have let us hear things like this at this time. Then the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson, and the child grew up, and the Lord blessed him. So again, here we see another instance where they have an encounter with the God of the Old Testament. And the thing that they want to know the most is his name, so they can have that more intimate knowledge of him to truly know him. And we've seen this throughout the Old Testament. And we read of it in 1 Peter. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. We'll read verses 10 through 12. Peter writes, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come that would come to you 
made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. And these things, which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which the angels long to look. And here we see that all the prophets, when they wrote, when David wrote Psalms 22, when Isaiah wrote Psalm or chapter 53 in Isaiah, they knew they were writing of someone great. They were writing of the salvation to come through our Lord and Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And they wanted to know him, to have that intimate knowledge of him. But the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, told them that it was not for them to know that yet. But they were writing these things to serve us. To serve us. Let that humble us for a moment. The things that they longed to have knowledge of, they wrote down that we may have that intimate knowledge. Not knowledge that we get to tout over everybody's head, but knowledge that leads us to love our God more, to love our Lord and Savior more and more. It's all written down. Because they were serving us. In John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus tells us, or says to the Pharisees, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And as Coach said, this right here, the words on these pages, do not hold eternal life but they point us to the one who gives us eternal life. They point us to our Lord and Savior. The law and the prophets point directly to our Lord and Savior. That way we know that there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And now the question is, so do we just have to know the name? Is it that simple? And the answer is no, it's not that simple. We have to remember what Jesus tells us in Matthew 7. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom. It is more than just knowing a name. And I think Agur answers that question for us. Turn back to Proverbs 30. How can we truly know the name? How can we truly know our God and our Lord and Savior? In verses 5 and 6 of Proverbs 30, every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will reprove you, and you will be proved a liar. Simply put, it is in the word. We can know our Lord and Savior. We can know our God by searching the scriptures. When when Elijah was told by God to go stand on the mountain before, because he was about to pass by, what was God in? Was he in the wind? No. Was he in the earthquake? No. Was he in the fire? No. But in the still, small voice. The still, small voice that still speaks to us to this day in the scriptures. Turn over to John chapter 1. (laughs) 
John chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that was come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And drop down to verse 14. It says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were given, were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him, or he has revealed him and declared him. It is Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh who reveals God the Father to us. He has come, or he came, to reveal him to us, to make his name known to us. Turn over to John chapter 17. And again, keeping in mind that the word points to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that he is the word made flesh. John chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus spoke these things and lifting his eyes up to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life this eternal life that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work which you have given me to do now father glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Jesus Christ has manifested the name of God the Father to all of us. And we have to realize that that name is not a literal name, but that through Jesus Christ we know the character and the attributes of our God. That we know our God through the word. Because as Jesus says at the end of verse 6, they have kept your word. How many times throughout scripture are we told to continually seek our God day in and day out? To seek him with our entire heart and being. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. With everything we have, we are to seek him. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Proverbs 8, 17, I love those who love me and those who diligently seek me will find me. 1 Chronicles 16, 11, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Psalm 105, verses 3 and 4, Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. We are to constantly seek after our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because it's only in seeking after him that we will have more of a manifestation of God revealed in our lives. 
To know Christ is to want to know him more. To know God is to want to know him more. So as it says in Hosea chapter 6, verse 3, So let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is as certain as the dawn, and he will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. And while that verse does tie into some prophetic teachings, it also has a very here and now application. Seek the Lord, and he will come to you. Ask, and you shall receive. Knock, and it will be open unto you. Seek, and you shall find. We must continually seek to know our God. Not to have knowledge to hold over people's head. Not knowledge to show off and brag. But knowledge that gives us a more intimate knowing of our Lord and of our God. Turn over to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. We'll start in verse 18. says, Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And God said, I, will, I, may, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, Behold, There is a place by me, and you can stand there on the rock. And it will come about, while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Now, I don't think Moses was a stupid guy. I think he knew what he was getting himself into when he asked to see the glory of God. And maybe he was stupid, but he had no excuse because God explained to him that no one can see me and live. And Moses went through with it. Just to have a glimpse. And all too often... Again, doesn't matter if we're talking about Sunday goers or the churches of God. All too often, I think we just say to God, give me a glimpse and leave me alone. Instead of saying, give me a glimpse and let me die. If it crushes me, I do not care. I want to know you more. I need to see your glory. I need to have it revealed in my life, manifested in my life. And brothers and sisters, that is what we get in this life, plain and simple. Glimpses of our Lord and Savior. Glimpses of our great and wonderful God. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. We're getting glimpses only. But in those glimpses, we know our great and wonderful God more and more. We know our Lord and Savior more and more. We love them more and more. And in that love, in that knowledge, that intimate knowledge of them, we long to make him known, known unto all the world. Because knowing God, knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is to want to know him more and to make him known. To declare his name among the nations. Let me ask you all a question. 
the Sabbath. This is the day the Lord has created. We will be glad and we will rejoice in it. Are we glad and rejoicing in it just because we know God commanded it, so we keep it, and we're in the truth, and that's it? No. Colossians 2 tells us, turn over there real quick before I botch this up. Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. You know, quite often we'll hear mainstream Christianity just say, the Sabbath is just a shadow. That's all it is. And typically, I feel like the churches of God cringe at that a little bit and go, yeah, but we're supposed to keep it. It's the fourth commandment. And yes, God said, keep the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day. But brothers and sisters, we have a more intimate knowledge of the Sabbath day that has been given to us by the grace of God. Just as Jesus told Peter, this did not come to us by flesh. It came to us by the very grace and power of God, by the working of his Holy Spirit within our lives. We know that the Sabbath is a creation and redemption memorial, and that it points to our Lord and Savior, that in him we have, we have become a new creation, and that we have redemption that our God will provide for us just as he provided for the Israelites in the wilderness, giving them manna from heaven and a double portion on Friday so they wouldn't have to work on the Sabbath. So yes, it is a shadow of things to come. But brothers and sisters, because we have that intimate knowledge, let us dwell in that shadow. Because in that shadow, I am near to my Lord and Savior. Let us dwell in that. Let us dwell in that knowledge, that intimate knowledge. And let it drive us to make our Lord known, declaring his name among the nations. In closing, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Brothers and sisters, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.